So the executive system is, is sort of a classic pri uh, parliamentary system where the president is the head of state. Uh, the president is uh, indirectly elected because there's a, an electoral college that elects him or her uh, for five-year terms. Um, the, this is a, really a symbolic role. Um, when you look at the powers of the presidency, there aren't a lot. Um, so the president can declare emergency rule, uh, which is great, but only with the prime minister's backing. Um, the president uh, appoints the prime minister, but really the president's seconding parliament's choice. Um, the key role is to create a governing coalition. Um, and, and if the president can't do this, uh, the president can dissolve parliament. So that's really the key role. Um, I mentioned a second ago, so when you think about the, the, the symbolic nature of India's president, I mentioned a second ago that the Indian president actually appoints uh, justices to the Supreme Court, but I also mentioned that they're based on seniority. So basically there's a, a collegium, a, a group of, uh, of, of um, judges that comes together and they present uh, their preferences and then the uh, Indian president technically appoints them. Um, but, but really there's not a lot of power for the president. The president's basically seconding someone um, pretty much uh, on around every corner. So the prime minister, of course, is the one with all the power. This is the head of government. Um, the prime minister does need the support of the lower house. Um, standard, uh, sort of, the prime minister is the one who runs the state, passes the budget, chooses the cabinet um, to run the various uh, ministries, etc., etc., etc. So a very standard parliamentary um, system, uh, except when you look at uh, who they represent. So the legislature, the lower house of the legislature, is, is the house of the people, the Lok Sabha. Um, and it's composed of 545 representatives um, who are appointed to five-year terms. Well, that sounds sort of mundane. It sounds pretty typical to what we've talked about. Um, where it diverges, though, is that each one of these 545 representative, representatives represents about 2 million people. Um, that's, that's a, a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so imagine what this means in terms of representation. Uh, imagine what it means in terms of having influence over your representative, about having access to your representative. Important to keep in mind. Um, this is the place where the government answers to, so they can grill um, the government. They're the only body that can call a vote of no confidence in the government as well. They come to power through a plur plurality SMD seats, uh, elections, but there are certain seats that are reserved for um, a class um, known as the untouchables, um, from the caste system, as well as two for the Anglo-Indian community. So they do have special seats that are reserved um, in, a, in a way that uh, gives you a PR-like, um, I, I guess, a PR-like function for at least a couple groups of people within India. Um, they do have similar powers as the upper house in many ways, except that they're stronger with respect to finance bills. So we'll go into the upper house, which is known as the Council of States, composed of 250 members. 12 of these are actually nominated by the president for their special knowledge. So wait a second, we talked about the British case. We talked about how India descends from Britain. Oh, that sounds awful. They don't descend from Britain. They gain their independence from Britain, but Britain heavily influenced uh, their political institutions that they adopted, including their constitution. And so, hey, lo and behold, the upper house has 12 seats uh, nominated by the president for their special knowledge. Well, that reminds you a lot of the House of Lords, doesn't it? Um, a connection. Uh, so these, the rest of them are elected by regional legislators um, through a PR system. And they actually come to power through a single transferable vote. You don't really need to know this. It's a complicated and different way to tabulate. But basically, you, the voter, go and rank order your votes. Um, then there's a quota the, that each candidate has to get to win election. And once your top candidate gets his or her quota, then subsequent votes for that candidate are given to the second person on those people's lists until someone from their list reaches their quota and down the line. Um, if your top candidate loses, then that person's votes are allocated to the next until someone gets the quota. So it is some complicated mathematical formula. Um, you don't need to know, um, you just need to know maybe that it exists and that it's complicated um, and that there, there's some sort of rank ordering involved. Um, it's very typical of the upper house in that it's weaker um, the key point where it's weaker than the lower house is that they can't introduce bills to raise revenue um, and they can be basically ignored on financial measures. They also have no vote of um, no vote of confidence in this house. That's exclusively uh, the domain of the Lok Sabha, the House of the People. Uh, in terms of parties, there are six national parties, those that are recognized in more than four states. 
Um, and these include the Indian National Congress, uh, or the INC, uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, um, uh, the Bahujan Samaj Party, the BSP, the Communist Party of India, the CPM, the Nationalist Congress Party, the NCP, the Communist Party of India, I just mentioned, so I don't know why I mentioned them again. Oh, because one of them is Marxist and one of them is just the Communist Party of India. So anyway, in the most recent elections, you've seen a series of alliances, which has uh, made this a little more simple for us. Um, the INC uh, led the uh, United Progressive Alliance in the last elections and gained 206 seats. Um, so the INC, as I mentioned, long dominated until the 1970s, really until the early 1990s, um, with the exception of one brief period. Um, they're generally a left-of-center party, so social democracy, affirmative action, very much focused on secularism, um, so separating the church from the, uh, from the state, um, or the temple from the state, or whatever it may be from the state. Um, they ran the state based on five-year plans. Uh, again, they were buddies with the Soviet Union way back when and state ownership of key industries. These were mercantilist policies of largely of import substitution, less focused on export-oriented uh, industrialization, more focused on import substitution. Under Indira Gandhi, as I mentioned before, um, the state became quite nationalistic, but under Rajiv, it was much more neoliberal um, and open um, to outsiders. And uh, when, I, when I refer to neoliberal, what I mean is that uh, rather than the social democratic experience that you had under the INC, Historically, um, Rajiv, um, beginning in the 1980s, takes this uh, state in a very different direction. And it's the direction that has brought India to where it is today, um, as this sort of uh, free market state that we think of it um, as today. Uh, the BJP led, in the last elections, the National Democratic Alliance, which gained 115 seats for that alliance. Um, the BJP challenged the government in the late 1970s, but especially in the 1990s, um, it was a winning party in the 1998 elections, for example. The BJP is a, a nationalist party, um, stressing Hinduness, um, nationalism, um, tolerating violence. It's also neoliberal, uh, giving it roots in the middle class. Uh, and, and so really what you see today um, is a BJP, which is neoliberal, an INC, which has gone neoliberal, um, but has more of a social democratic stress uh, but with these sort of, uh, I suppose the, it's, it's better to think of it, about it sort of like the, hmm, maybe the conservatives in Great Britain. Um, and then finally, you've got this third front. Um, and this includes former, the former left front. So the Communist Party of India, Marxists, the other Communist Party of India. Um, and this is not a revolutionary group. They, they gained 77 seats in the last elections. They're not revolutionary. They're much more social democratic. Um, and what's key is they have actually been crucial to um, coalition governments. So they're regionally based, but they're strong in a few important states. Again, go back to uh, how they come to power through the plurality SMD system. Um, so you have to be strong within certain districts to actually gain seats. Um, and they have been strong in certain areas. They average about 7 to 10% of the national vote, um, which doesn't make them a force on their own. But as I mentioned... Um, they have been um, key to certain coalition governments. Um, is that a blessing? Is that a curse? Well, we've talked about that in the case of France. We've talked about that in the case of the UK. So think about that. Is that a blessing or a curse? Um, you do have various regional parties, especially ethnic-based parties, that have grown since the INC lost its hegemony in 1991. An important point that once uh, a liberation uh, party or organization come party... Um, eventually breaks down, um, you have room for other things to take its place. And so some of these ethnic-based um, parties have come about. Um, the SMD system facilitates this type because you win districts where you're concentrated. And so you've got a concentrated ethnic population in a particular place. Um, you're going to have more likely um, power coming to these groups um, on a local level because on the national level, they might have, um, they might gain a, a couple seats, but they're going to be uh, really... Uh, drowned out by everybody else. But what this uh, suggests is that you've got the risk of secessionist tendencies. Uh, so in, in terms of today's government, just a little uh, a snapshot, um, it's led by the United Progressive Alliance under Prime Minister Singh. Um, and one of the things they've actually been engaged in is a, a huge war on corruption. In 2009, um, supposedly nearly a quarter of the 543 elected members um, of Parliament had been charged with crimes, um, some crimes, very brutal crimes, 
um, but various crimes. And, and so there's, there's corruption has been a major issue in India. And it's often a front, front page issue. Uh, well, in our newspapers, maybe a page A6, page A10, may, okay, maybe page A12 issue, um, but very much front page um, in India. Um, I'm going to go on and talk about civil society and, oh wait, let's see, okay, I'll break it up. All right. Hold on, coming back in a second.